Thank you so much for joining us on Straight Out of Savannah. I am super, super excited for my guest today. Miss Aaliyah McDaniel is here and she is going to share who she is and what she's all about and how she can help you. So Aaliyah, take it away. Hello, everybody. I am Aaliyah McDaniel. I'm your spiritual guide, coach, and advisor. I work very simply with Black women getting us free. Now, what does that mean? That means liberating our spiritual practice, liberating our self-care and our self-love and our healing journeys. Because so much of what we do is being the leaders in our families and our communities and our jobs. But I really wanna teach women how to master and be the leader of themselves and of their journey. So that's primarily what I do. And I do that through the lens of spiritual coaching and life coaching. That is so amazing because we need that. You know, I can say we as didn't. a black woman, we need that so badly, <laughs> my gosh. Um, because we, you know, over the years and centuries and, you know, millennia, we have been vilified and, you know, and we have been made to believe that, you know, we are like the lowest creature, really, when you think about it, you know, uh, just barely above black men and definitely below white women so you know um that is something that we need so tell me how did you start on that journey oh my gosh this is a, it's a we could have an hour and a half conversation about this i'll do a quick story about it so the quick story is i've always been a spiritualist whether i call myself that or not i've always had the gift of sight and the gift of prophecy and the gift of visions from a very very young age and over my life, I've always been a church girl, but in the good way, in a way that my family didn't go to church regularly, but I was always in church. Um, and as that that blossomed into my my adolescence and my adulthood, I really started to understand and wanted to get to know God for myself. What is God and who is God outside of the structure of the church and the structure of religion? And where do these religious rules come from? And so that led a long journey um, about just understanding cultures and understanding religion from both, you know, the scholarly perspective, but also from my lived experience as a black woman, as a lesbian, as a mom, as a wife, all of these things and trying to make sense of the world. And through that work, not only um, did I do that work and do a lot of that healing work for myself, but also people that I've loved and have been in community with. And, and it's just kind of grown organically over the years. Um, I am an ordained minister. I am a hoodoo priestess or practitioner. I am a life coach. I'm an educator. And so all of those things really came together for me just to simply live who I am and bring other women along on the journey. Oh, wow. That is so powerful because the thing is, is um, most people, when they go on this journey, a lot of times they don't know how to articulate that. And so that that's something that I love, you know, how you did that, how you shared. That was just amazing. So tell me from what made you get to the place where you decided that this was what you wanted to do as um, like a career type of thing? The truth is a long time I was in hiding. So when I first got into like this, this public space, it started off a long time ago when I was a blogger, like, you know, way back in the early 2000s, I'm really dating myself and I used to be a blogger and I was a mommy blogger, believe it or not, I was on my trying to conceive journey. So I was on all of the big blogs and I was writing about, you know, my cervical mucus and how many eggs this month and the whole, the whole nine. And through that journey, two things happened. One, I discovered that I was had infertility issues and I had a history of miscarriages and the whole thing. And two, I became divorced and nothing will test your faith like loss. And during that time of me just experiencing two major blows to my identity, it wasn't just a matter of the circumstances that were happening, but I identified and had always wanted to be a wife and had always wanted to be a mom. And those two identities were taken away from me. And I had to go through the grief and go through the healing of, well, who am I without that? What do I believe about love? Why would a God that I love and I serve do this to me? I'm putting this in air quotes. And I've been doing everything right. What is so? It was a crisis of faith, a crisis of faith, and in that journey, I started to to really try to 
excavate and understand what made me tick? What did I understand and believe about God? And how does that fit into or not fit into the structures and things that I that I believed? And so that, that really started my quest. Um, and in, in reality, with the with the Christian church, that was a whole other conversation or a whole other journey. It was a parallel journey because that journey started with me even just coming out to myself and not, and trying to reconcile the message that that I'm an abomination, but also being told that I am wonderfully and marvelously made. Which one is it? Because those two things can't exist in the same place. And I will never forget the day that mm. God spoke to me in my heart and gave me my vision for my life and my truth and my clarity and i understood not just about what god was telling me but realizing that i had that personal relationship with god that was that didn't matter about the structure the building the pastor the preacher but i had direct access and that was the voice and that was the relationship that i continued to cultivate regardless of the walk in in the the external parts that uh, that is and so as I grew, my practice grew. So it started off then with meditation and then it became metaphysics and then it became all of these different layers and layers. And it reminds me so much of Santiago's journey in, and I just lost the book. I'm looking at it right now. I want to say the Iliad, that is not the name of the book. And I read it every two years and I'm losing the, I'm losing the name. It's going to come to me in a second. But anyway, the whole journey, and it's really about the hero's journey because at the end, I realized that the, the thing that I was running from and the thing that I was seeking both for myself. Mm. And once I understood oh, that, I, wow. that the answer lived in me and not because me as Aaliyah McDaniel, as this human incarnation, but me as tied to my Ashe and tied to my God mm. sense, and that the answer was within me, that set me free in so many ways and allowed me to also tap into who I am as a Black woman whose people were born in this country but were descended from the mother continent. And that allowed me freedom in tapping in into who I am. And so it's a, I'm saying it in a very short, succinct way, but it's been a journey and it will always continue to be a journey. But that's, that's the, I'm not trying to sound poetic, but that's really been how, how I got here. Um, learning, discovering, excavating, grieving, being human, being God, sense, being all of those things at once. That is so powerful because the thing is, is so many people are on that journey but they don't really know how to navigate and they don't know, you know, yeah. how to, you know, what I've learned is how to get quiet. A lot of times that is really what it takes is, you know, getting quiet with yourself and blocking out all the noise, you know, in order to be able to connect with, you know, your spirit uh, team. Um, yeah. So share the journey coming from your professional life into this world and and how that how you were affected and maybe how even other people in your life were affected by that. Yes, yeah, so my professional professionally I'm an educator so that's everything from spent 10 11 years as a teacher then I became you know an instructional coach and then became an administrator and now I'm a principal supervisor and so it seems like if you were to look at it on the paper it would seem like these are two very different worlds right an right. educator who running schools or running school systems and then a spiritual um, coach on this side but really there's a lot of overlap and a lot of the overlap is me helping people realize their best self it's not about being a dictator it's not about being the head person that's telling someone what's right what's wrong what's truth what's not truth but helping people develop the skills and develop the vision and develop the processes in order to pull out that truth and out of themselves and um i think that that's the mark of someone who is an, actually an effective leader versus yeah. someone who just wants the title and i'm not saying that to toot my horn but you can always pay attention to the people that they want one replicas of themselves yes two they want position so that they can have power over others yes. versus 
people who want, who use their position to empower others and to bring their power and their expertise out. So for me, that's that's the, um, the parallels of my journey. And I love being a practitioner in each space. When I am coaching principals and coaching teachers and coaching those people, my job is for them to get clear about what their why is and what their vision is and who are they serving? And what is the purpose of this community that you're building that you have the honor of being a part of? And then what are you creating and how do you do that? And I want—I don't want to just tell you the things to do so that you can be a replica and be a clone. But I want you to figure. I want you to learn that skill so you can replicate it yourself. When I am being a coach, a spiritual coach, I'm actually creating systems and structure to your journey. Yes, I've kind of had this organic experience where I'm going through life and learning things, but it doesn't have to be that convoluted. For everyone else and so part of what I do in my individual coaching and in my individual mentorship as well is actually create a blueprint for people to be able to figure out so what are the things that I need to figure out first then what comes second because so many of us go round and round and round in our healing journeys because we're trying to one do too much at the same time we're trying to <laughs> we're trying to figure out ourselves and we're trying to do this but we don't want to let go of the messaging and I want to question the messaging and then we're trying to do Reiki on Wednesdays and meditations on Sundays and then church on and it becomes a lot. And so I, I create a blueprint for people to be able to follow, not because again, not so they can become clones, but so they can do things in a in a sequential way that spiritually makes sense to be able to to enhance and move along their healing and empowerment journey. Oh wow, that oh my God. Oh, you said a mouthful. Um because one of the things that I know about is when you start on this journey, you want to do so much, you know, you, yeah, especially if you excited. know that you're we're excited, you know, and especially if you know, you you're an empath and you, you know, you, you know, you've had gifts all your life and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, because I don't know about you, but I was hiding for many, many decades. Mm -hmm. oh, and I knew. Oh, oh me too. <laughs> I was trying to be a life coach and just be cute and keep it just about, you know, success and this. And that was fine. But what I found was that I almost felt like I was back in the closet again. I'm like, I don't want to say anything that's going to offend people and I don't want to turn people off. But the reality is that the more that I kept myself small, the more I wasn't serving. And in order for me to serve in my truth, I had to tell my truth and who I was. And then by doing so, it became not only a model for other people to tell their truths, but allow my people who really want to work with me to work with me. Because everybody, everybody want to be a, a bandwagon person. Everybody want to follow you on social media. Everybody want to see what you're doing and what you're wearing and what your photo shoots look like. But who actually wants to do the work with you and who's actually equipped and called to do the work with you? And so it was important for me, and I'm only saying this in retrospect, but it was important for me to tell the truth about who I am just because it became exhausting trying to keep it keep it cute and keep it like how the girl boss image that we were being taught 10 years ago yeah I I agree completely with that because that's the same thing it's like you know like like me I I do light language and I do it amazingly and I and I and it's so healing and I know that and I sing it you know but I have hidden that for so long you know and so finally I had to I had to open up and honestly it was my mother that said that she she didn't she didn't she, what she said was she said you are holding back mm -hmm. and I said I don't think I am but then when I started examining and I started looking at things I was like you know what she's right because I was speaking a, a level of the truth you know and I was showing a mm -hmm. level of you know who I was but I wasn't really going all the way out like I knew that I needed to do you know what I mean and it was like okay you know I was trying to do like you said I was trying to keep it cute and I was trying to keep it you know PC and you know I didn't want to offend anybody and you know and then I I knew that I you know I had so many my family is everybody's an evangelist or a prophetess or something or whatever you know and all that and so I was like okay I, I'm all, you know I don't want to offend them and this and this and that and after a while I was like you know what I can't worry about them I can't worry about that. I was like, I have to do what I know that I'm here to do. I said, and I know mm -hmm. that I'm here to disrupt that stuff. Yeah. Yes. You know, so. And it's about obedience too for me. I, 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 I remember God saying to me, and I'm using the word God because that's the language that, that yeah. resonates with many people. I remember spirit. And I started using Gus now. 
Yes. <laughs> Are you going to, one, you going to listen to me or no? Mm -hmm. Have I ever led you wrong? Are you going to be obedient or not? Yes. Because the reality was I was so busy worrying about the image to other people and forgot that I have never, ever, ever been led astray, ever. Yes. So as long as I follow and I know when God is speaking to me versus ego is speaking to me, I'll be okay. And I had to remember that. Yeah. And see, that's, that's a powerful thing because a lot of times people will get the guidance because what I find is people come to me a lot of times and they're like, oh, well, I, I can't, you know, I can't get the guidance. I can't hear. And when I guide them through a process to connect to their bodies so that they can be begin to feel these things and, and understand and realize that they are being spoken to, it may not be audibly, you know what I mean? Because everybody maybe doesn't do clear audience. That is my strongest gift. So for me, I know that that is real. But there are people, they, they're like, oh, well, you know, I can't get any guidance. You know, God is not speaking to me or the universe or source or whatever you want to call it is not speaking to me. Or, you know, I, I don't have a spiritual team. And I'm like, yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, you do. You do. They are speaking to you now. It might not be audibly. You know, you might go somewhere and, and there's a book right there for you that you need to read. Mm -hmm. You know, or you might go somewhere and somebody says something to you, answers a question that you have. You know what I mean? But they they don't often pay attention to that. So because when you we've were, been taught often that God only looks one way and messages only look one way and revelation only looks one way and we become divorced from the natural experiences that we're experiencing every day. Yes, yes, that part. It's like, you know, um, I had somebody before tell me, well, God only speaks through the preacher or the priest or the pastor or the, the prophet or whoever, you know, and I'm like, no, no. <laughs> they don't even no. say that in the Bible. There's a reason why when Jesus was born, there were three wise men because wise men is a modern language word for magi, the magicians. There was a reason why David had had um, the astrologers and we don't want to talk about that part, but they had no. the prophets and the people that, that interpreted dreams in, in the, in the, the Pharaoh's house. I'm losing all my words, but there's always been clarity and examples, even in the Bible around how there have been multiple voices of God. Yes. But people don't want to do that work and understand, but you yeah, know, but they, who no. Say no, they don't, they don't <laughs> want to do that because that would just be too hard, you know? And then the other thing is too, they would have to confront their limiting beliefs. That part, that part, it's not hard. They would just have to let go of the stuff. Yeah. That's really actually holding them back. Yes. And you know, and what I've learned during this, doing this work, and I want to know, have you had this same type of um, experience? It's like, um, people will fight for their limiting beliefs. They, they will fight for, to hold on to stuff that's holding them back. You will try to yes. help them, try to sh help them shift. You know, you'll, you'll guide them in meditations and journeys and different things. And they will, hold on for dear life to those limiting beliefs because grandmama told them or, you know, it's what they learned in church or, you know, when they went to whatever they went to Bible school or whatever it is, you know, and I'm like, but can you not see, can you not see, you know, the, the, I definitely have had that experience. And let me tell you when it really came and hit ahead for me. So remember back in 2020, the summer, I, I know we, history will give it a name, but I think about it, the hot summer, George Floyd summer. And I mm -hmm. felt like everything was converging at once. We were trying to convince people that black lives matter. We were trying to value human life within the face of the pandemic. That's when, if you were in the black spiritual spaces, a whole bunch of bullshit was going, I'm sorry, can we cuss on this podcast? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there was a whole lot of um, stuff going on about fakes and frauds. Mm -hmm. And I remember that that six seven month period for me was a lot of i was defending and fighting and arguing and doing all these things in online spaces and real spaces and i remember that december um of 2020 i was in physical therapy my whole back was locked up and it was really 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 bad and my therapist said to me you're stressed and burnt out and i'm like what are you talking about i'm you know she said, because I noticed in you, you carry a lot of things in you. And when you don't acknowledge it, 
it, it shows up in your body. And what I realized was that I had been putting so much energy into arguing and defending myself to people who was never going to see my humanity to begin with. That there was part. no point in me arguing and trying to convince people of their beliefs and their things because they didn't want to. And so it was wasted energy for me. So yes. now I don't debate with people anymore about their religion, about race, about whatever. I don't, whatever you believe, do you boo? Because I'm not going to try to convince you anything other. If it's working for you, great. I'm going to talk to the people over here who are interested, who have an open mind, who are ready, because I'm not going to simply just on a very simple level, I'm not wasting my energy for that. Yeah, I'm over 40. I'm in my mid forties. I don't do that anymore. I'm not trying to convince yeah. nobody of what they believe anymore. And I feel like that's where some of us get it wrong because we've, we've had the aha and it's coming from a good place. We want to bring everybody along because we see the truth. We see what's happening. We recognize the place that they're in. We know that they're, that they're in a system that is defeating. We know that it doesn't work for them. Yes. And then we're the ones walking around frustrated, banging our heads against the wall. Like, why can't they see? Why won't yeah. they just wake up? Yes. That's not your ministry. What about this? It ain't your ministry to try mm. to convince and convince anybody else. And what I've had to learn, and this mm. is through life in general, is that people are on their own journeys. You don't know what function that is serving for them. Maybe they are fulfilling their grandmother's dream. Maybe they're carrying out their generational trauma. Maybe it's for somebody else in their family to set them free. That is not your ministry to convince anybody else to be on your pattern and to be on your path. So I don't do it no more. I'm not about to be stressed, keeping up and I arguing and being an ether talking. I'm not doing it no more because the same books that are available to me are available to them. The same knowledge that's available to me <laughs> is available to them. And if they don't want to see it, I ain't go. I don't have a time and the energy. My people are my people who are saying, I mean, I know Aaliyah. Can you help me with this? Or can you point me in this direction? Or can you provide me this resource? Or can I schedule a reading with you? Or can you mentor? That's that's my ministry. I'm not I'm not convincing people. We see what happened to Martin and we see what happened to Malcolm. Regardless of the how they died, we saw that Martin, when he died, had a heart. They said his heart had the congenital failure of someone who was in their 60s and 70s, and he died in his 30s yeah. because of the stress. Yes. We said even though Malcolm did everything that he did for the people, would it cost his children, and we saw that follow through in his grandson. Yeah. I'm not doing that to my family. Yes. I'm not doing that to my family. I'm not doing it to me. Yeah, and and that that's real stuff because it's like, no, we we're, we're not designed. We're not supposed to do that, you know. I'm not I, feel, I feel that too. Anymore. You know, being an empath, we feel people, you know. Mm -hmm. But but just like you said, you know, you have to protect yourself too. Mm -hmm. We have to protect ourselves, and you know, I feel the same way because you know what, I'm in my mid fifties, <laughs> so I'm really not not going there. And I had to learn that though. That was something that. It was kind of hard for me, you know, because mm -hmm. I love people and I love for people to grow. And, you know, I like to see people, you know, live in their best life and all of this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And I, I know yeah. that it's possible, but, you know, you see them limiting themselves, but you can't do anything about it. And it, it kind of is like, you know, the conversation that we had in the green room about our parents. It's like, you know, you see what's going on, but if they don't want to listen, we can't, we can't change their mind. You know, we can't change. You can their be mind. an example. The best thing you can do is to be an example of the truth. Yeah. And hopefully maybe one day they will ask you, well, how do you do this? And how did you do that? Then you, that becomes an opportunity to minister to them. Yeah. Be, the, be the light. Yes. Be it. Yes. That Not part. speaking and telling. Yep. That is the part because it's like, ah, we can't get anywhere with that. <laughs> And I, I have learned that as well. It's like, no, no, no. I'm just going to, I'm going to say what I got to say. And I'm not going to be afraid of it. I'm going to step out there and I'm going to be who I need to be. And the people that need to see, need to see. Because, you know, I, I truly believe that we all have people that we are assigned to. Yes. Oh, I love that. I'm sorry, I'm taking notes over here because this is this is feeding me. You know I'm doing that. That's what I do. <laughs> I usually tell people I'm I take notes, you know, but but yeah, because I mean it it really is. It's like once I think we get that and we realize that, then it makes all of this work so much easier. 
You know, it's yes. like we get in that flow state where, you know, we are in the place where we're supposed to be and we're doing the things that we're supposed to do. So now when you, when somebody reaches out to you for say like a session, what's the first thing that you do when you, um, you know, start your sessions or when you, when you start working with them? So the first thing I like to do is I do it. I do an intake questionnaire and the intake questionnaire is not even about the spiritual question, but I like to get a feel of what level people are coming in on. And when I mean level, I don't mean it in a hierarchical sense, but I want to know, is this the first time you ever heard of spiritual readings? Have you had them before? What work have you done to, to deal with this problem, this issue? Not because one is better than the other, but it helps me have an entry place. Yeah. And also just frankly knows what language to speak with them. What I yes. mean by that is for the longest, the majority of my clients, and I will say up until this year, actually, majority of my clients were in the closet Christians. This is what I mean by that. If you see them on social media, they praising the Lord, saints, they got all the good Bible scriptures up. They, they belong to so-and-so, Mount Carmel, New Horizon, <laughs> Bethel AME, and Zion Church. And that's what they do. But they over here wanted to have a little bit of, of a spiritual reading. They ain't going to tell their mamas and them that they got an altar. But, you know, they just they're doing it covertly because they're scared. Nothing yeah. wrong with that, but they're scared. And, they're, and yes. so I'll call those people Christian plus. They're Christian, but they, they doing this over here. That's been the majority of my clients. And so I want to know what language I need to speak to them. And then I have people now more recently, because I'm out. So they like, girl, I do the, I work with the fairies and I have a light and I got my, so it's, so it's a range. But so the first thing I do is I do an intake just to understand where are you at on your own journey? Because I, because depending on where you are also, not just because of the language, it's going to be dependent upon the work that you have to do with yes. whatever the issue is. Mm -hmm. So then we go into the session. I make people understand, I start off before we even get into the actual reading, I tell people what a reading is and isn't because everybody mm -hmm. that's seen a skeleton key, everybody that's seen ease by you, everybody have a Hollywood <laughs> version of what a spiritual reading is. <laughs> Most people, I would say 99.9% .9 of people think I'm getting ready to get in there and tell them that somebody's about to die in some doom and gloom. Because the internet Baba Lawas will be in your inbox convincing you if you don't do this three ways and send this chain message in 15 ways and knock on the door two times and sprinkle salt on your shoulder, then somebody in your family going to die. So they always come in with this fear about mm -hmm. whatever it is that's going to be. So I dispel that fear. I let them know that everything I'm telling you is diagnostic. It's not prescriptive. Diagnostic, not prescriptive means if you were to continue on this path, this is what you can expect. However, you have free will. You always have the ability to change the outcome. And yes. so I tell them that. I let them know I'm a spiritualist. I am not a psychiatrist, which means that it is not responsible for me to listen to some, to listen to things that are signaling depression, mood disorder, some yes. other issue going on. And me yes. trying to tell you that you can solve bipolar if you just drink nettle twice a day. That is yeah. irresponsible and dangerous. Yes, yes. And so, I'm gonna, uh, and so I need to know that. I need to know people where they're coming in. And I'm never going to give any medical recommendations. But what I will say is I'm going to tell you what my suggestions are. And I'm also going to suggest if you need to follow up with your medical doctor or medical professional. And I'm also going to let you know based on what you're telling me and based on what your experience is all, if this worth it, I'm prescribing you is best done in a therapeutic session with someone who is qualified to do this. For example, if we're talking about some childhood trauma around sexual assault or something, and you are and you have not done that work previously with a therapist, yes. don't go start trying to do the work I'm telling you to do by yourself. That is dangerous. So I want people to know yes. what to expect. And I do it not because I don't expect that everybody's going to work with me forever. But it's my job to always be teaching. That's where that teaching comes in. So I tell them what they need to be listening for and knowing. So if they decide to work with someone else, they know how to screen for someone who's credible versus someone who's going to be charging you $10,000 every two weeks. And we see we see all kinds of examples of people being yes. for their money, being psychologically harmed. And I want them to, to be equipped with that knowledge. Yes. So after we we get the we get the 
formalities out of the way. They understand how we work. We understand that I'm going I'm not going to just tell you stuff and I'll leave you out there. I'm going to give you some homework. I always say I'm going to give them 30 days worth of homework, but end up being six months worth of homework because I'm like, boom, boom. I can see my, my gift of sight is very clear. I know exactly where you're starting, why you got to this place, what the, what the foundational things that you need to be doing in your spiritual practice, and then what specific mm. things that you need to be doing to deal with whatever the issue is. And then I, then I channel. I tell people I use cards because it looks pretty to the people because they feel like if they see me pulling cards then it, it feels more authentic to them. But the reality is the moment that I saw your name come across the screen, I just seen your whole beginning, middle and future. But if you want me to, you want the cards to verify? That's cute. That's fine. And we're going to do it's that. Hollywood. So then we're gonna do that. It's, but it's Hollywood. And also people, it goes back to the thing that people know. People need to see you doing something physical to believe it. Look. <laughs> Listen, if, but if that's what it takes, and I always laugh because 99% ain't no surprises. I'm like, yep, it said what I already knew. And if that's and, and, and that was also part of my own journey because actually when I first started doing spiritual readings, I did not voluntarily do spiritual readings. I had people come to me and say, can you do a reading? I'm like, how you know I do that for myself? And I ain't never advertise this. And people's like, I know you know. And, and I was scared because, not because of what was being revealed, but I was scared to step into my power. I yes. remember the first time, the yes. first reading I did for someone else, I was holding back because I saw something, but I didn't trust it. And she mm -hmm. goes, oh, I thought blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, damn it, that is what I saw. So so part of the cards were for myself and me confirming what I already knew. Now, yes. we, we might get to the cards, we might not get to the cards, and that's all well and good. So that's what I do. Yes. And then I'm going to feel that's good. Because my perfection self. In the recording, I'm gonna send you a recap. This is what it is, there's a recording. And then also what people should know when they do a reading with me, it's good for 30 days. And what I mean by that is within the 30 days that you have a reading with me, you, um, if you have follow-up questions, clarifying questions, whatever, you can always reach out to me free of charge. I'm not gonna charge you extra for it, but that's like, you know, quick quick fixes or quick um, adjustments. Um, we do that over email or um, in inbox messaging or text messaging. And so I do that. And that's that's what a that's what you get for a whole one hour session with me or 45 minute session. So I try to pack it in because a lot of times two things happen in readings. One, I'm not telling the person nothing new. They already knew. They just needed to have out external confirmation. That's what I about tell people. Well, I said it's a confirmation for you. You already know this. And then and then 90 percent of the people and this is where my part of, of separating is I tell them the things to do. I would say less than 10 percent do it. Yeah, because you know why? It's work. I was going to say they don't want to do the work. Do they want us to do it. They just want you to. They they want us to do it, or they want to go on Etsy and buy something cute and think if you just burn this candle and light this whatever, then it's going to be done. And yes, that is part of work. But they want they people don't want to do the work, and that's okay. Yeah. That's where they are right now. Yeah. So so they get a reading from me. I hope that one day they go back and listen to those notes. So they go back and they they check it off, and they're like, when they're ready to receive it, that it will be there for them. And some people do actually, because I have seen that, yeah. you know, I had somebody, I did a service for a lady and it took her a year before she actually really mm -hmm. went and looked at the report. I gave her almost a 20 page report and mm -hmm. it took her a year before she actually really started diving in. And she was like, oh, and she was calling me back. And she happened to be a friend of mine. So I was like, I thought that you, you know, looked at this. I said, because I asked you, did you have questions and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, no. People, yeah, they don't want to, you know. And then, then like you said, they may just be not be ready at that time. Yeah, you know, yeah. and and that's, that's their all big, right. Their big yes. yes, it's okay. That's why I say it's all right. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you with the cards. I resonate with that because I got about, mm, I don't know, twenty, thirty. <laughs> Because I love, I love some of the, the artwork is so good and, you know, and, and, and the messages and they're always on point because, you know, they're us. But what the experience that I had this year was that spirit told me, stop using the cards. So I was like, mm -hmm. okay. And at first I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> but then I had opportunity where, you know, I did a reading because I, I um, read in a metaphysical shop once a month. And so I had a lady come through and I was like, and I didn't have my cards because I was doing something else that day, but, but she came through and wanted a reading and they asked me because I was there and they were like, you got time to do a reading? And I was like, yeah. So I did. I just read her without cards and everything. And she was like, oh, wow. She said, do you use cards? I said, 
sometimes, but not today. Because <laughs> I didn't have any with me. <laughs> but um, do you find that um, when you are doing the readings and do you find that most people want the cards or they don't want the cards? Um, I do my, I actually don't use video when I do my readings. And so P I'm not, I'm trying to think, I'm like, do people, well, you, you do it on the phone? When I'm, I do it over the phone. I do readings oh, that's over really the phone. Good. Okay. Yeah. So I do that because my clientele are all over the place. I have people in other countries, I have people, I have people literally all over the place. And so I do it, I, I set it up and I have a business line. So we call and I do my readings over the phone. Um, what's important though, and I think that this matters whether you're in person or over the phone, is that you're tapping into their energy field. And so I have my methods for doing that. And then when I'm done, I close that portal as well too, because I've had too many instances of I'm dreaming about they people and all. I'm like, I can't, uh -uh, I got too many people around me. I got my own stuff to deal with. I don't need to be bringing everybody into my dream, my dreamscape, because that's where I do a lot of my spiritual work is in my dreamscape. Right. But um, I do, so I, I do a mixture. Most of the time I will say I do my initial part based on whatever is jumping out at that moment. Um, and then I'll do I'll do cards to either confirm it or just to, just to be part of it. But I do I will say I do a mixture. Okay. So time. now did you did you get like training in this or did you like initiate as a priestess or anything like that? That's a great question. So I'm a hoodoo practitioner, and there's a lot of discussion and debate around um, initiation. I'm going to tell you Elias' belief and experience. Yes, you that's what I want to know. <laughs> And I'm and I'm saying that because hoodoo is different regionally, right? And there's there's a lot of misconceptions about it. I will yeah. say my experience with it is that you must be initiated into it. However, initiation isn't always what we think it is, because a lot of times when people think initiation, they think about um, African traditional religions, they think about Vodun, they think about um, Lukumi, Luka they think about all of these different things where there, where there's more public rituals about what it looks like. In Hoodoo, initiation looks different depending on your family, depending on your region, depending on age. Okay. So I've had a variety of initiations and different levels of initiation. Also, Hoodoo is, is who we are as Black people. So there are things that we experience that we didn't even realize was an initiation of sort. Let me give you, so I went through formal um, initiations, like my coming of age ceremony that I had as part of my community. It was a formal experience, a year long process. Yeah, that's I was what also I said, initiated. Yeah. I was also initiated when I turned, when I was 14 and I got invited to the kitchen with the women cooking for Thanksgiving, because that was the sacred space. The women in my family stayed up all night the night before Thanksgiving, and it was you, 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 you have to be invited into that space because that's where not just the cooking is being done, but yeah. the stories are being told. Yes, the yes. That yes. was an initiation. I got to sit mm. in there and listen and learn. Then initiation is when you get invited to the grown woman's conversation. That's yeah. an initiation. You may not call it that because it doesn't have a name for it, but it is very, it's an intentional passing of wisdom mm. and practice that we do in so many ways that we don't even recognize it. Yes. Here's another initiation that we, sometimes, that so we do good. in church, but it's actually not Christian. So in my family, I grew up CME, Christian Methodist Episcopal, and we're the ones that, the, we got the motherboard as all black churches do, and it does not come from Christianity, that comes from West African belief. The motherboard, when you get invited to be on the motherboard, not everybody gets to be on the motherboard. In my family, it's the oldest daughter. When they get of a certain age, okay, they get, you are now on the motherboard and you gotta wear that white uniform every every Sunday. And I'm not talking about the Usher uniform, I'm talking about the motherboard you, with, the, with the doily and this and the dress and all of that. Yeah. So we have initiation, even though we don't call it that. And we don't realize it. So I say, I like to say, I've been initiated in many ways. Yes, I have studied formally within in different hoodoo circles. I am mentored by elders as well. And I learned card reading on my own, actually. I learned card reading yes. both through uh, some of those formal places and, and spaces that I've been in, but also meshing my own visions that I've been having since I was 
four, five, six, seven years old and now having a tool to make it real. Mm, yes, that's so powerful because you're right. I had to think about that because I remember my grandmother. So we were raised in Pentecostal holiness. So oh, y'all, y'all were who through and through. The founder of Pentecostal holiness. Come on now. Let's tell you the go. truth about who he was and what he was. Come on now. <laughs> I thought about all that shouting we did, you know. <laughs> the, the ring shout, the laying of hands, the yeah. dance. That's not We're just coming out feet. of nowhere. That comes from us. Before it belonged to the church, we yes, syncretized it with, with religion. Mm. See, that was that was powerful to me because I remember she actually decided to be a pet. Well, she said she was called to be a pastor because she was the, the highest thing she could be in the Pentecostal church was a missionary mother. Mm -hmm. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't. Uh, I think they, they would give her like five or 10 minutes to introduce the speaker, the pastor, whoever. You know, and she, of course, they all called her if they needed anything or whatever, and they needed prayer and blah, 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 because she also had those gifts as well. You know, she she mm -hmm. was like, and I, I honestly believe when I think now back on it, I believe that she was like undercover too, really, mm -hmm. you know, because she she this, had all those gifts and I she knew I did. Scholarly study. There's scholarly study about that. We could talk about that a whole nother time, but there's scholarly study about that. And it's really interesting because the spiritual center of the church is the woman, is the mother. Yes. When things get rough, who do we call to pray on? We, we call, call the pastor. Mm -mm. We call the pastor for the rights, for the somebody's getting ready to die. They got to do the funeral. They got to do whatever. Right. But when you talk about the intercess intercessory prayer, we call in the mothers of the church. Yes. That's who the pastor is calling for yeah. spiritual guidance and wisdom. Yes. And there's an initiation when you become part of the person that gets to pray and to lay hands. That's an initiation. You don't just get no Joe Blow just get pulled up from the from the from the congregation to get to do that. There is a spoken or unspoken passage hmm. of wisdom that gets pulled down and then you get elevated to different places and positions. That is initiation. Hmm. When you change from one position to the next position. And we do it all the time, whether we call it that or not. Man, I feel so honored. The room is an initiation I into feel so marriage. Honored. Oh, that's awesome. Because you because you don't really you don't you don't think about that, and then you know nobody really talks about it either. You know because they they're it, so busy trying Let me to. Let just tell you what a thing is. It's because we see everything as black as ignorant, and we don't give it the same honor that we do to everybody else's culture. Unless it came from Puerto Rico or it came from Nigeria or it came from Egypt, we don't honor it with the same esteem as we do everything else. That's why I say hoodoo is my religion. I'm honoring it with the same esteem that I would give somebody else's church or somebody else's religion that has the same things. We have our own language, we have our own traditions, we have our own beliefs, but we don't honor it because we've been taught to hate all things that are African-American. Oh Lord, that part. And you are so right. We could probably go on another hour. <laughs> you gonna have to come back. <laughs> you gonna have to come back and do another show. We gonna do it. But uh, so tell me something that um, if anything in the world, you could change. <sighs> tell me what that would be. I'm going to tell the truth about what came first to me. And let me be clear to the listening audience. When I talk about black women being my center, this is not at the denigration of anybody else. Yes. I'm talking about who was at my core, my calling, yes. my people. Yes. So what that means for everybody else, chew the meat, spit out the bones. Yes. What applies for you applies for you. And if it don't apply to you, don't be offended. Just take what does apply to you and keep it moving, okay? Yes, yes, and yes, yes. One thing, I want all Black women to know our power as the leaders, spiritual leaders, financial leaders, political leaders of our communities and of our people. We have this division where we have a lot of women trying to get free of all the psychological bonds mm -hmm. and we have a lot of women trying to be small and be submissive and subservient but if you know who you are whose you are and who you come from 
you would realize not only in the power that comes with that, and I don't mean power in a typical masculine way of domination, control, yes. and fear. Yes. I mean power that it is not by accident that we are the center of the family. It's not a bad thing. It's just who we are. Yes. I want black women to know who our juice is because when we know who we are, we set ourselves free. We set our children free. We set men free. Yes. They can yes. be their full self and know that their full selves and their full identity is not in control and domination and subjugation. Yes. When we set ourselves free. That's what I want. That's what I want. That's what yes. I want. And that's what I know yes. like I know. And that's what's going to be. <laughs> that's what it's going to so be. It is not that. Oh, my God. That is so amazing because that is the truth. If, you know, because the thing is, is you're right. We are at the center. And, it, and it's like, I think what it is, is just like you said, we need to know it. We need to know and we it. And we're not afraid of it. We so, so often the thing that makes us, us gets, gets seen as a bad trait. But the reality is whose house do we all gather at? Big mama's house. Even if they separate, we don't call that grandpa's house. We call that big mama's house. Yep. Who's taking care of the kids generation after generation? It's big mama. But now what some people will have you think is, oh, single momhood is bad and this, that, and the third. But the woman has always been the center. And there's a reason for that. We can talk about the history about how that is and how that's actually what's most natural to us. Yes. But we, we're so trying to think that that's now bad because these external people said it's bad. So we're trying to shift and be subservient and play ourselves and play ourselves down and dumb. Mm -hmm. But that's not who we are. And when we become free, we set everybody else free. Yes. Oh, that part. <laughs> that, woo, that is amazing. Oh, my God. That is so powerful because you're right. We set ourselves free and we free the world. Oh, that's good. That's powerful. All right. So we are going to land this plane. Um, I am so excited. <laughs> This has been so good. I always say that about all my shows, but they all are. And this did not disappoint. I, I'm just so pleased that you came to join me, Aaliyah, and we talked about this. Um, we're going to have to do a part two for sure for all of you guys that are okay. listening, because this is this woman is the truth. And I have had such a pleasure just being in her energy. And I'm I'm just so grateful that she came on the show. So share with the people where they can connect with you the best. And, you know, don't worry, all of your links are going to be in the description and in, in the show notes and all that stuff. But just just tell them, you know, where's the best place to connect with you? Because, you know, some people like Facebook, some people like Instagram, some people like website, whatever. Yes. So if you want to know all my all my stuff, my website is aliyahmcdaniel.com. I know that'll be in the show notes. Very simply, that has a link to all my socials. On all social media, except for Twitter, you can find me at Hey, Mrs. McDaniel. That's Hey with three Y's. And then on Twitter, I'm with two. I hang out most on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. That's where you can find me. Awesome. Awesome. So if you are looking for her, because I'm telling you, she is so powerful. And I'm, I am so grateful that she has entered my world. And so if you want to enter her world, you can find her all those places. And like I said, everything will be in the show notes. So you'll be able to go in there and click the links and all that stuff. So I'm just so grateful and so honored that you have graced my platform. And I, I'm just, you know, I'm just, I love your work and I love you. So again, you guys have a wonderful rest of, you know, the day, the night or whatever it is that you listen to this or you watch it because it is going to be on YouTube and it'll also be on um, Spotify and Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Listen Now, Radio Breaker, Podbean, and probably some more stuff, more places too, but those are the ones that I know. So anywhere that you listen to your podcast, you can hear this. So make sure that you're listening, make sure you download, make sure you like, share, and subscribe and send it to people that need to hear this because this yes. needs to be heard. This is just amazing. So again, and if you are a spiritual entrepreneur and you would like to come on straight out of Savannah and talk about it, make sure that you reach out to me and all of my information is everywhere. You can Google me. So again, thank you so much for joining us 
on Straight Out of Savannah. Aaliyah, I so much appreciate you. Bye Thank now. Thank you. Thank you.